All right, everybody, special guests in the house tonight. We're in the basement with a Stranger by the Hour podcast. Guys, please introduce yourselves to my guest. Hi, my name is Aaron Branfess, a co-host of Stranger by the Hour. And Cody Anderson, the other host. And uh, we're actually in the basement too, man. So this is working love it, out well. Love it. I think yeah, that's where you. all pods like start from, someone's basement. Now, we, we had like a studio in his nice-ass house in Wilmington um, when we started out. But now uh, we, we're out in the out in the boonies now. So. Yep. Nice, nice. So, yeah. yeah, honestly, I noticed you guys off Instagram, man. Like, some of the stuff you were posting, I think when you, like, you just see like-minded things, you're drawn to them on, you know, on different platforms. But you guys are really explaining the whys of things, you know. And, and a lot of that stuff is, I don't know if there's a stigma behind it, but whenever you start really, like, getting behind, like, the whys and the hows thing happens, like, it, all, it hurts some feelings. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, and Cody, like he's he's the one most active on our social media, and basically he he's a little a little more. It's good though because it stimulates a lot of like arguments and conversations and shit. But you know a lot like we're we're you know prior military guys, Marines, and so and then our our podcast isn't necessarily about anything to do with the Marine Corps except that or the or the military except that um, through our work as contractors um, for the pa past few years. We got into um, a bunch of like information operations, deception planning, things like this. And we were taught a specific method on how to use information against people. And then we realized that, hey, look, not, someone's not using. Off, bro. What's deception planning? What's well, hey, real quick. Yeah. Yeah. You want us to give us. No, uh, I, I, I know and maybe we'll give, means, you, we'll give you a quick, uh, quick, like little background and that'll make make it make more sense. Yeah, you got a deeper background. You want to start with yours? Uh, all right. So, you know, retired Marine, I did 20 years in the Marines. Um, I was an infantry guy in the beginning, um, got into the scout sniper community, like pretty young after, you know, just being in the fleet a couple of years. And then, um, eventually I ended up at, at force recon and I was there when, um, Marsoc got stood up. So, you know, secretary of defense said, Hey, look, Marine Corps, you're going to stand up this component of SOCOM. And in order to do that, they took a bunch of guys from first and second force recon initially and kind of waved their magic wand. And we're like, all right, you guys are now part of the Marine special operations command, um, which is where I met Cody. And, um, I continued on that until I retired until in uh, 2016 and then immediately went to work as a contractor initially for JIDA, which yep. if you guys deployed and you used um, equipment that was funded and paid for, but yep. your mine rollers, MRAPs, Valen, metal detectors, whatever, um, provided all that equipment. We worked on the ups, like upstream defeat of these IED networks or whatever, which led into a bunch of other things that we can touch on later. But like we got into the um, information space um, as planners in that respect. And then, well, Cody and I worked together there, but why don't you give your spiel? So, yeah, I joined in 1998 uh, for the infantry, but I didn't go straight to the fleet. I went to security forces first. So I did my first uh, chunk of time up at uh, Bangor, Washington, guarding the nukes. And uh, when I was up there, I got I volunteered. You know, it's always better to volunteer. I volunteered for their CQB unit. So that's when I got into like CQB and breaching. And that's also where I met EOD guys was in breacher school. And then so when that tour ended, I went to 3rd Battalion, 7th Marines and ended up in Kilo Company out in 29 Palms. Um, I ended up as the assault section leader and that's what I, we invaded Iraq as, as the Kilo company assault section leader. I uh, came back on the advanced party for Iraq, went to EOD school, graduated. And, uh, so that was like late 2003. I graduated 2004. Uh, my first gig from there was I went to Okinawa and they shipped me right back to Iraq. So I did the second battle of Fallujah, Phantom Fury as an EOD guy. Came back and I was cooling my jets at Miramar as like a air wing EOD guy, which is a, a which is a, a nice form of hell. <laughs> and, uh, 
you know, it was about that time, like Aaron was said, 2006, they were standing at Marsoc. So they kind of like flipped through all the books of EOD guys looking for dudes with prior combat experience. And so I got bumped by uh, the guys over there. And so I was, uh, went to Marsoc in 2006 and stayed behind the fence line there from 2006 to 2016. I switched to being a warrant officer in 2011. So uh, uh, 2011, I left the 1st Raider Battalion, which was 1st MSOB at the time. And uh, went to the fucking Puzzle Factory in Quantico. And then uh, went from there right back to 2nd uh, yeah, second Raider Battalion. And I was their EOD officer. Um, got out in 2016 and got on that gig that Aaron was talking about where it's, we started learning all the fucking dark Jedi shit of like uh, military uh, military deception, so MILDEC, psychological operations or PSYOPs, and um, just general information operations. And uh, they actually sent us to schools for that. So we went to the uh, uh, Special Operations Military Deception Planners course. Um, so when these things sound like we did work on a lot of like special access programs and, you know, these kind of things that are firewalled off behind, you know, these various different classified programs, but you can go right now on Google and search the military deception was a 30 tack, whatever. I don't remember uh, the pub name, but joint pub three tack. Yeah. The, 14. The, the, the pub for how, so the fact that the military, you know, does deception is not classified. And then as a matter of fact, the baseline pub for it, you can just get on the internet. So we're not saying we're not, you know, spilling any beans when we say that, and it, obviously, like Sun Tzu, art of war shit, right? Like deception has always been a part of warfare. Um, but just it, you know, time now, we're we're very organized about the way we do it. So, so you're you're honestly the first two that have been vocal about working for something like this. Because honestly, whenever it comes to talking on socials or anything like that, people you know they drag their feet a little bit on that because you know there's 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 red tape when it comes to it, and I, I don't think you know social media has really been acknowledged in the the military sector as being like a proper form of putting over information to the public, because I mean, honestly, look at, look at the news right now, but being, being, being as, you know, two that were a part of that life, how looking at what's going on today, I mean, where is your minds at? Because I mean, you've seen firsthand how this stuff is utilized and I mean, well, bro, forget, forget where our minds are at. Where's our ass at? It's on a farm right now. <laughs> Uh, out in the of the so he and I are both like urban, urban motherfuckers from California. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like we're not, uh, dude, like, you know, my trajectory in life wasn't to, you know, seek out, uh, growing my own food and fucking with animals, you know? So of course. that should tell you like, kind of like where our heads are at. So to kind of dovetail off that a little bit. So when COVID hit, we were both kind of on off cycles, right? We were, we were deploying together. And by that time I had like con the office up in DC to, to send us back to Marsoc. So we were working at the Marsoc headquarters as their defense threat reduction agency, uh, like uh, planners, sensitive right? activities, sensitive advisor, activities advisor, which, which is a cool gig. Cause like it included us deploying with, uh, you know, these special operations task force. So we're still in the command. We're just civilians. We don't have to get haircuts and shit or run PFTs, but we still get, you know, one, four to six month deployment a year. And then otherwise we're working at the, the base. So, yeah. so COVID hits and uh, it was our buddy that was downrange at the time anyway. So we basically get locked in, a, in an office together, man. So we're, we're <laughs> you know, which is kind of like the, a, a bad place to put the two of us. So with access to bit shoot and shit. Yeah. With access to, <laughs> to bit shoot and fucking like, um, so for eight hours a day, he and I would, you know, sometimes sit in that office and just whiteboard shit out. There was like literally a whiteboard behind us. Right. And so being a bomb guy, man, like, uh, I had done some pretty high level biological shit, man. Like it's, uh, one of the last things I did, my, my last gig in the Marine Corps was I was the Raider, uh, Raider regiment EOD officer. Right. So, really? yeah. So, you, you know, the only two, the only dudes above me was the Lieutenant Colonel. This and the is my Colonel, point. Right? <laughs> yeah. And, um, so, one of the last things I did for them was I went out to JSOC and I sat through a um, sort of like a discussion, uh, like a tabletop exercise. Right. And uh, it was a tabletop exercise to do with uh, like the, the preparedness of how we were with biological weapons. And, and really what my gig was, was, uh, you know, we thought the GWAT was winding down. So Marsoc is like looking for new missions and shit. Right. So maybe the maybe the counter proliferation thing might have been something that we could get into. And um so I'm watching all this this wild, high-dollar, crazy shit that they have going on, right? 
you know, they can decon like a whole fucking helicopter there, dude. It's like, it's, it's wild. It's like, and so that, that got me into my mind, into my mind about, uh, you know, what was required to deal with a potential, uh, uh, like viral weapon system, right? Like it's, um, and it's always funny, dude. You always think somewhere else people have their shit together, but to be at like the tier one level and watch a motherfuckers argue, like, oh, we don't do that. That's your job. And like the national security council guys, like, well, it's, it's pretty fucking disheartening. To see but, that at that level, that must be scary, dude. To, to yeah, realize that like you're at the tip of it to a certain degree and it's still yeah. just. Well, at the time, nothing was really, oh, I forgot that was like 2015, right? So, so then this bio, so then COVID hits, right? And, and it's, uh, at, this, this is YouTube. So everything about it is exactly what it was told to you as. And, and the, vaccine is safe, <laughs> the vaccine is safe and effective. Talk to your doctor. We're not doctors. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nor do we yeah. pretend to be. Yeah. But vaccine. so when it started and, and the team that we were on with Ditro was kind of a cross-functional team. There was a, a lot of dogs and cats, right? Some green berets, some fucking, some seals, uh, us. And, and then some dudes who were just on the team because they had like thousand pound heads, man. And uh, one of the guys, uh, Tim, that uh, Cyber Tim. Type. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Cyber Tim, uh, his, his family's all thousand pound heads. So he, he kind of gives a, a protocol of um, what his family's doing with it. They're all doctors, right? Uh, like, hey, you know, you come home, you put all your clothes in a hot dryer, you go right into the shower, et cetera, right? And that, and that kind of clicked in my head, like, okay, this is decon shit. You know, I've ran a lot of decon shit. And um, so I was like, I was just looking at it through like an EOD perspective of dealing with this, this stuff. Right. So, so like the first two weeks go by and you're like, okay, like the bodies aren't fucking piling up. And like another two weeks go by and you're like, all right, the motherfucking bodies still aren't piling up. Like this is supposed to have like a two week cycle of like, you know, and then I start, right. I start looking at like the protective measures that we're doing. And I, and I, I click back over into like a, you know, the explosive attorney mode. And I'm like, you know what, man, if the commander was like, Hey Cody, check it out, man, we're going to go raid this place. Cause ISIS is making fucking, you know, basement influenza. Yeah. Yeah. yeah right. Like, like what, you know, cause out there in Iraq, they were, they were cooking up like chemical weapons, like mustard and shit. And so I was thinking to myself, like if I was to advise the commander on what the assault force should wear on their way in there to, to keep them protected at no point in time would have I said the fucking face panty was was good you know what i'm saying it would have been like positive pressure shit like reaper suits like shield seba type shit like at no time would be like oh yeah we're good if we just fucking if we just go like that we're gonna be fine right so that was the first thing that kind of clicked in my head and then and then i would watch the newscast like this this motherfucker is using rhetoric dude like yeah these dudes are using like the approaches that we get told on how to move targets around the country so we can kill them, right? They we would uh well like once like we're so we get trained in like how to use information to manipulate people, right? So b the game so for creepy, dude. the game for you know for regular kind of like special operations guys is um you know how can you use information to move someone from where they're not targetable? So let's say we're operating in you know I don't know Africa and look look we have a battle space that includes fucking Somalia. But this motherfucker that we really want to kill, he hangs out in Kenya. We can't kill people in Kenya. So what do we got to tell this guy to get him to pack up his shit and move into where we can kill him? So that's basically the gist of kind of like how, how you know, what the what the context is. And so there's like you got these little gambits, little techniques. Right. And you you're you're using um, language in a certain way. And so we're just kind of like consuming all this. Like he said, rhetoric like this is you get it's pretty easy to spot once you are trained in it you're like well okay these people are making claims right but they're not it's pretty obvious to um the things that they're saying are like unfalsifiable like they're making this claim and like you know they're not bothering to demonstrate whether that's true or not or how you could check that it's true or they're not backing any of it up they're just appealing to authority so that's the main kind of fallacy there is hey this is the situation this is what you have to do about it this is what we're going to do about it how do you know because we motherfucking say so i'm like well that's that's not how that works, you know what I mean? <laughs> right. <laughs> but for a so lot of people, is, it's, it's well, good. This, this is, I mean, when you when I when I put out that short about you guys, when I followed the one that you were talking about, this is why government involving in military means so much to you guys. Because I mean, 
when you're at that level and you see that these people like they're they're doing these things to influence trends and do right like, you, you could point out the blatant lie like everything, and it's so clear to them everything you know I mean? that you've been taught your whole career to to save your own lives never had a face mask on. that's well I'm and right. you know and it, when it comes to the information part it's like from your so you guys even for, like from your own experience you know so just take like put yourself in yeah, I guess you guys were probably both. You were both in Afghanistan and or Iraq or something, right? Yeah, both, Afghan. both, both Afghanistan, right? Okay, so Definitely. all right, so you go to Afghanistan, you work, you work with the A and A, right? Like you've seen yeah. these guys, okay? So you 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 you've had some exposure to the Afghan military. Go on a, a deployment or two, work with those guys, come home, and then you're watching the fucking news, and there's some four star general, three star general standing there, and he's like. Yeah, you know, we're within six to eight months of the Afghan National Army being able to completely run shit in Afghanistan. Yeah, right, yeah. You're about to hand over the keys to the whole thing to them. They're doing great. They're the shit. The Taliban's on the run. And you're like, what the fuck's this guy talking about? Dude, you're like, yeah, this dude was just smoking hashish in the right? back of the fucking patrol. Yeah. So fucking you know, three so, weeks ago. So there you, you go, go right? Set. So you know, like just from your own experience, right? Like you see it. Yeah. How much, how much did you two both work with either ANA, AHP, or a policing uh, body over there. Well, or in Iraq, because in Iraq, we did the same thing. Yeah, we, our first trip to Afghan, we were together the first time in Afghanistan is 2007. Yeah. So we, we call these, we call these guys the pirates. We didn't even have ANA back then. And we had ALP. So was it half Muja Muj guys and, and half like yeah, Arnold? dude? It was a it was all it was just whoever they could scrape together to put those shitty blue uniforms on. And <laughs> yeah. so they were like no, a really dude. low level partner force. They sucked. Eventually, um, like I I was on the commando team where we worked with the ANA commandos, and they were a competent light infantry unit, no doubt about it. Like some of them were suck, but most of them they'd been I fighting. Liked the, I liked the commandos. Like I liked working with those dudes. They I fought agree. well. But they're at the top end of their the spectrum. Most of the guys, most of the ANA are dog shit. You're even if they're not terrible human beings, they're fucking not capable. They shouldn't be of, there, yeah, dude. They're, they're not they're calling in a medevac for their wounded buddies or something. You know, they're not doing any of the shit we do. You know, and to kind of dovetail, uh, uh, use that twice now, so I'll stop using it. Like to to follow up on what Aaron said uh, earlier, I was in Afghanistan in 2010 doing village stability operations, like a, vill- a VSP platform, and uh, so. I was way out west, and our nearest uh, little little base was Farah. So we would do like a tactical ground movement. We were both 2010, 2011 Afghan guys, so I know exactly what you're talking okay. about. Okay, so we would do like a tactical ground movement, maybe like once a month to get back there and do like get more beans, bullets, and band aids and shit. And I typically turn into like a vampire hours kind of guy when I'm there. So I'm okay. I'm sitting in a little chow hall there, at like you no know, three in the morning or some shit, eating like the ice cream I get access to. And they've got AFN up there, Armed Forces Network for oh, folks. Yeah. That- find this and don't know what it is Nothing but the best yeah which is like propaganda right yeah and it's like, <laughs> dude it was a uh, yeah if any dude if anybody watches that they'll just become a terrorist because i think we all beat our wives and bounce checks and like fuck so at but, what uh, point did you realize your life was v for and vendetta pretty much because that's <laughs> so it was, you know it was it was right there man so i was i was sitting there eating the, and, and just like aaron said the um fucking whatever the combined joint afghan generals there right so like some three star or some shit and he's doing the exact same thing that Aaron was talking about. And, uh, you know, there's an ANA crew right over the fucking HESCO from us. And uh, I'm like, this motherfucker is lying, dude. Like, and that was like, that was like one of the first like little breaks in the dam, man. You know, like. Bro, you're honestly, you guys are both throwing so many gems out there. And we, I'm with you right now. I hear everything you're saying. I want to be able to explain this to people so they can understand really what we're talking about. So yeah, we 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 go fast. We we take it for granted that everybody knows that uh, the government's pure fucking evil and like. So the, I, there's a reason we feel this way. Uh, I, have, I have a question now. Yes, yeah. sir. Um, I was a combat engineer. I was attached to two four. We were in uh, Northern Helmand and Nalzad. Mostly. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, I had never heard of the the term psyop guys mm. until I was operating there. They had two dudes, two fucking huge white guys with longer hair, beards. They dressed them up like Hajis, and they had fucking music that blared out of this car. <laughs> yeah. I swear to God. There was only like fucking 15 of us in this this little fucking mud hut. Sure, but I'm just a sweeper. I'm, I'm attached just to sweep. So yeah, I'm, I'm looking at these guys, and I'm like, who the fuck are these guys? And they're like, oh, those are the PSYOPs dudes. I'm like, what the fuck is yeah, science, science, bro? <laughs> Like, yeah. I have no idea what this is. And they're like, oh, they go out and get them revved up. <laughs> yeah. Uh, 
there's a lot of so the the guys you saw those those are army uh, psyop guys and they're part of USASOC, so that's a U.S. Army Special Operations Command. They consolidated all these psyop guys to be part of that command. Um, they do a, a a wide range of things, but part of that includes going forward with. They'll do like radio in a box where they've got a, like a, a radio station that they run that puts out propaganda, like U.S. propaganda, pro Jaroa, you know, government of Afghanistan propaganda. But yeah. sometimes they're literally just fucking with the Taliban. Like, it, dude, they were play playing Metallica. Player. Yeah, yeah, that's what I'm saying. Like, just, just they go. were blaring Metallica from yeah. the early '90s, and yeah. I'm like, what the, oh, are you just you're like it's like shooting the fucking bees nest with the hose. Let me explain yeah. this so people can understand this. So basically. That's real shit. There's dude. a difference I, between I Taliban never... and Afghan government. And the Taliban is basically... Well, not anymore. <laughs> exactly. I'm getting there. So, so is the Taliban freedom fighters that are religious extremists that portray the Quran differently than people with money or, or, or class in Afghanistan? Because if you look at Afghan's history, it wasn't always like that, bro. It, like Sangin, like like Helmand Province, nice. It was like good areas. They were they were trying to bring uh, a form of uh, I think construction there or something. It, whether they were relying on their their natural resources, which of course is, I mean, poppy and oil. Do, yeah, what I mean, whatever you want to point. I mean, but but still, how do you how do you push on different factions of the Taliban by pushing? propaganda from the afghan government to get them riled up so we can be well none of that shit work none of that action. shit none of that shit works so that it's a complicated question with the taliban because the talib just means student you know so the taliban as you know ideologically are just people that are you know kind of close to like a sharia law like a strict um orthodox interpretation of uh islam whereas you know you've got the the guys that originally before we started meddling after the Soviets, after we helped the Mujahideen defeat the Soviets, then you had basically um, all these warlord type guys like Masood and stuff who they, they were Muslims, but they didn't see they didn't have as strict an interpretation of, of Islam as the Taliban. But mostly they were they were warlords. They were like drug dealer, arms dealer, kind of big baller type, um, you know, and then different ones ran their areas differently or whatever. But um for who cares though? Because like for what this is the, we're we're talking about a country on the other side of the fucking world. Uh, but I can tell you for what Americans should be interested in that there's no Taliban fighter that was any threat to any structure or human being in the United States of America, facts. right? Facts. That's facts. Okay, so what we were told, and eventually I didn't even care. So just this is like a mindset thing. You could have told me, uh, I don't know, that we were in Afghanistan to make sure to steal all the Pokemon cards or something. I wouldn't have given a flying fuck. Like I just wanted to be there. Right. Yeah. Same. But I, I didn't care. No, we we're Marines. We're like, yeah, right. of course yeah. we want to go. Trying to do that. But from, but for selling the whole war to the American people, uh, we, we get sold this thing that, okay, you know, Osama bin Laden, who's the guy that did nine 11. He didn't, but that's, let's put that aside. This guy, Osama bin Laden, who we created, who was our guy before. Now he's not our guy anymore. Up he's up there in Tora Bora somewhere poking around. Oh, shit, he just slipped out. We just missed him. Well, he's there somewhere. We got to find him. Okay, well, we can't find him, but now we're going to stay because what we can't have is Al-Qaeda <laughs> training camps popping up. It all was just like nonsense that we just accepted. No we're sense. like, yeah, yeah, totally. Like, we should definitely be there for 20-something years. It's yeah. fucking absurd, kind of, you know? <laughs> Let me ask you a better question then. Why are we so interested in it? What, like, why go through all of, even if we did somehow were involved with 9 11? Like, even just consider that. Why? The money simple answer. answer is that um, it's money laundering. That's yeah. the simple answer. That's just an extreme level to take um, it just on money. That, so that well, it's well, not just money. money. It's, it, um, you got to understand, like, and it, it goes into this larger economic thing. Okay. So, our entire financial system, the 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 basically the global financial system, aside from like BRICS and these people that are breaking apart recently, the entire financial system is that 
It's completely financialized and debt based. It's like a big Ponzi scheme. OK. And the reason that we get access to goods and services and stuff at a relatively cheap price and we have an elevated standard of living compared to most of the rest of the world is because most of the world after World War II uses the U.S. dollar as its reserve currency. OK. Now. Anybody that tries to pull out from that, Iraq, Libya, you name it, right? We will invade and kill them, depose their leader. We yeah, will exactly. Choose, we'll do all this kind of shit to make sure everybody continues to use the dollar as reserve currency. You guys might dig this. I used this analogy earlier. That's one of my favorites, man. So there's that scene in Goodfellas where... Uh, All-time favorite movie. Best movie. You know what I'm saying? I figured. <laughs> so I love that movie, too. So um, basically, um, Joe Pesci and Ray Liotta are always going to this guy's club. And fucking around, right? It's it's the, it's that scene, you know, the uh the funny guy thing where he comes over and the and the the, the bar owner the bar owner oh, yeah. brings, funny like how funny how yeah, 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 yeah. 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 so the bar owner brings him a check. Joe Pesci busts a fucking bottle over his head. You know, it's like so. Then that guy goes to Polly, right? So then there's this is the scene I'm about to talk about. So the way that I I tell people to to think about this is in in that scene, the restaurant owner is going to Polly. Right. The restaurant owner is any fucking country. We'll just say it's a country, man. Like, uh, I don't know. Who gives a fuck? A Tunisia. State? Yeah. Tunisia, whatever. Yep, yep. So he's that country, right? Holly is the United States of America. Now, uh, the restaurant owner is bitching about Joe Pesci. Now, in this scene, we're going to say Joe Pesci is the CIA backed fucking terrorist organization in that area. Right. And he's got Ray Liotta sitting right next to him, who's going to be like the Department of State. So, yep. Wow. Polly, uh, so so the owner is telling Polly like, "Hey man, I got these fucking terrorists in this in my country, just fucking up the place all the time. You know, these guys are arch criminals. What the, like what what's going on? You know, I do I do right by you. I let you move, you know, uh, goods and services through my country. I'm doing all the right things. You know, and Ray Liotta is sitting next to him like he doesn't know what the fuck Joe Pesci's doing. You know, um, because that's typically where the CIA hangs out is in the yep. Department of State. It's yep. like the Office of Regional Affairs is what it's oh, called." Yeah. Yeah. So he's just sitting over there smiling like, yeah, I don't know what the fuck is going on. Right. And so basically what happens is, is Polly's like, OK, well, you know, now we're going to take a piece of your country. And by taking a piece of your country means we're going to move our military in there. We're going to drop a base. You know, we're going to we're going to start uh, we're going to bring in some uh, centralized currency. We're going to bring in a fucking there button. might be resources that we get. Yeah, our you know, basically on. pillage it, rape it. And it becomes ours through. Yeah. And so the rest of that. Yeah, the rest of that scene is like, well, cool. Now, now we can run up fucking credit. Now we can take their minerals. Yeah. Now we can. Now we can do every this. Every month you gotta have my money. Yep. Yeah, <laughs> and every month it's like, down, fuck you. Pay yeah, me. yeah I, you know, I can have a war in your backyard where I can just drop. I love off. how you just compared those. So that was beautiful. Though. That's a great yeah. way to break yeah. it down. I've never, never thought. Of and at the end of the line, just like in Afghanistan, in the end of the line, when you can't drop another bomb, when you can't blow up another MRAP, when you can't fucking. Yeah. Wow. When, you, when you can't get one more w, double amputee, you fucking <laughs> burn it Light down. Match. Yeah, burn it. Oh, and then burn guess it. what happens? Oh, look, Ukraine's cracking off. Look at Life that. Life and death at Abbey Gate. Yeah, look, yeah. look how fucking magical that is, you know? And then... Uh, so, a lot, like, a lot of veterans don't like this, the shit that we talk in this way, right? They're like, they're, patriotic they're, Americans... Now, you gotta explain that, though. Why? What's yeah, the I'll tell you. I'll tell you why. I'll give patriots. you the whole I'll we give you the whole country. And if, All right, if so, we... we're talking about mythology, okay? So... The Marine Corps is a little bit different. Marines are a little bit different because the Marine Corps has its own entire um, mythology, right? That's that's self-contained, right? So Marines want to go to combat because it's like what Marines do, okay? But so kind of take the Marine Corps aside, but like the rest of the Department of Defense, the military, the patriotic people, all the boomers that fucking... You know, all all this like this patriotic mentality, B1 bombers flying over the NFL game, all this other shit. Right. The mythology is, is that we are the shining beacon on a hill. We are all we're ever trying to do is export our wonderful, beautiful democracy to all these backwards third world shitholes that don't have it. They're better off for us being there. Tie a yellow ribbon around a tree. Right. Like the America gets to feel good after Vietnam, where we shit on the veterans and all that kind of stuff. We changed our, rightfully so, we changed our mentality about all that shit. And so it's like kind of like a national project that everybody supports the military. Even shitty leftist, like liberal people, they don't, they're real careful not to really shit on the military, which is just part of the problem, right? So, so we, we get invested in this myth. And then especially that, as you ask, like why veterans don't like this, it's because 
then the mythology becomes personal. All right. So now I'm a combat vet. Like I've been, or whatever, I'm a veteran. I've served my country. Well, then I build a whole personal story around that shit. I get discounts at places. People are constantly That's thanking me for my service. Oh, and oh, by the way, I get told every time I turn around that I'm damaged. I need, you know, I, and it's this whole story that gets built up and we get attached to that story. So then when a couple of fucking wise asses like us are like, yo, you know that the Sackler family was just pulling all kinds of dope out of fucking Afghanistan to make billions of dollars. And they're Stupid. just like, you guys are real assholes. And you're like, no, we're just telling you the truth. Yeah, you're we don't, never we're getting back on YouTube. We don't sell coffee. We don't sell T-shirts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. uh, we don't. We don't sell anything. I mean, it's three bucks to join the Patreon, but we don't. We're not selling anybody. But we're not, we're not financially uh, incentivized. But in the to long, keep the fucking myth going in the long run, right? If I, if you know, there's a lot, and it is, it is the case that veterans are suffering. You know, I mean, I know you guys probably do too. I know a bunch of people that have self deleted. You know, to use. I know you can't. You gotta be careful what you say on YouTube. But they've taken themselves out of the fucking game. You know, and you're like. Yeah. You start to I, I really started to wonder like what that's about. And I think that you're cog you're you're even if you want to buy into all this super patriotic rhetoric and all this stuff, you know better. Like you know that there's something wrong. Yep. And then so if you don't confront that directly, if you don't go, hey, look, this was fucked up. So like we we clearly like are fully confronting the fact that that all that stuff that we were up to was not what they said it was about. But I'm perfectly fine with that because I have a different whole story, you know, where it was like, hey, I don't really none of that was my fault. Like, I'm not organizing, you know, these whole I'm not staging nonsense wars in in support of some debt based Ponzi scheme. I literally was just like serving my country doing Marine shit. So yeah. it doesn't hurt. It doesn't. I would rather know the truth and confront it. Yeah. Then have this like cognitive dissonance going on that's causing me all this pain and shit where people are, you know, t thanking me, thanking me, thanking me. And it's like, dude, what the fuck are you thanking me for? Like we did all this wild shit, you know, that didn't need to get done. Yeah, I agree with what Aaron's saying, man. Like it, it comes my ability to to reconcile everything I got into is <clears throat> simply that I under I remember the mindset I was in when I was doing all that shit. I was I was serving honorably within the paradigm that I was given by people that I trusted. You know, and so when I look back, I'll, you know, either good, bad, terrible days that I had, whatever the real story was and that snapshot, like I was standing in honor, you know? And so as new information comes in, you know, it's a uh, truth should have no predestination, you know, whatever the, whatever the newest, best information is, you, you update your intelligence, you know, the intelligence gets updated. And since my, my, my truth journey doesn't have a predestination. I'm, I'm fine updating my current paradigm. Okay. Well now I know the truth. And so now, now I will never go to somebody else's country and assault them, you know? So it's like a, it's, it's a growing phase, you know, it's a growing was and a shed. This, was this you know? all a process for both of you? Because you're, you're oh, yeah. extremely yes, self-aware and, yeah, yeah. and, and being at that level, how do you even knowing, how do you even remain positive? You're, you're a very, very slim margin of, of individuals that watches this circus. I and you can uh, understand it at the level of that. Does that make you feel? Yeah. So I, I, for me personally, I'm like a big fan of novelty, right? So I, I like allow myself to find the humor and all this shit and like enjoy it. I also, I'm also on like, like part of my process is like, I've become like a very spiritual person not in a not in like a like a super organized religious way or any kind but i i'm, I'm kind of like i think this is mostly like a holographic 3d video game you know what i mean and like i take it seriously you know i got kids that i'm raising and but i'm like uh, i don't think this is 100% real anyway and so Great. like i'm allowing myself to enjoy dude and honestly looking back i have no, i loved being in and I'll tell you the one thing that I skipped in my intro, like I, I did 21 years in the Marines and made it all the way up to the vaulted rank of E6. So my, ah, um, yeah, no, my, salty um, motherfucker. Well, yeah. was, uh, I might yeah. be the last, no shit. Like the last fully active duty guy that fully went to the end and retired. And it's not like I made it up to E8 and got busted. No, that. So I had, I had my hiccups along the way, you know, and there, there could be like some reasons that I would be resentful or something. No, I fucking love, I loved, I, to me, it was like, um, 
I'm able to look back at that time. However, whatever, like it was actually about or whatever, I just harvest all of those memories and stuff for, for I'm constantly like reaccessing all that shit and reliving it in my brain and like taking the valuable lessons from it. Dude, I can say, you know, and it wasn't always this way. I don't have any depression. I don't have any PTSD. I like the, my way of processing all this shit is like, I got exactly what the fuck I asked for. And like every, every bit of it, like y'all did, like you, yeah. you ended that's up exactly where you wanted to be real take on that, bro. Dude, that's it. Like you, you get everybody, you get what you want. You get what you ask for in this life, really, whether you realize it or not. And that's a trip too. even the bad a lot of people shit, want to be real about that. That's a trip. Even the bad shit you at some, in some way by your actions, by your choices, by your, your attitude, whatever you're, you're signing up for all the shit. So, so my route what to positivity is this. <laughs> yeah, my route to positivity kind of looks like this, man. Which is a uh, everything I did in the Marine Corps. Um, I I was operating under my metaphysics at that point was I was a a, a materialist atheist, man. Like, uh, you know, I was I just figured have to be. Yeah, I just figured you know when the if I got my ticket punched, the lights were, were just going to go out. You know, that's um, kind of how I do too. I mean, yeah, I mean, so. Since then, you know, I've I've done a lot of introspection. I've done a lot of reading. I've I've done a lot of, uh, you know, assessment of this weird fucking thing we're in called reality, right? Yeah. And and from that, you know, I I I worked my way back to spirituality. I don't and I don't I don't um I don't subscribe to any book religion. You know, I th I think that's all religion religare. It's relegating. You know, it's all a like control system kind of shit. But I, I try to have like a one on one like personal understanding of, of, of what this creator would, would be trying to do. And what I've kind of come to my, my, my medical physical stance right now is that this is some sort of like soul selection type thing. And in, in, in most high, in most high power, like military selections, what you're running off of is an unknown time and unknown distance, right? We'll take Delta force, for example, right? You know, the long walk those guys take, you know, you, they don't know how far they have to go and they don't know how long they got to get there. So really ha that's a massive mind fuck, right? Cause you don't know if you should sprint and burn yourself out. You don't know if you're going too slow. It's like, it's, you have to perform at your highest level. Right. And, um, really what it comes down to for me is, you know, with all this black pill shit that I believe, you know, you know, being the bomb guy, oh fuck dude, being a sweeper, bro. That's fucking brutal. You yeah. Know? That's a brutal game. Yeah, like, uh, you know, humbles you real quick at a young age you know somebody's like hey bro check it out that's the path right there you know and, and you're looking down that fucking like well-worn path next to a canal and you're like god damn you know it's clearly where you're gonna put a fucking ied like a natural yeah. line of right uh what it comes down to me is how you're gonna act man you know what i'm saying when the chips are down and shit has to happen which is every day in life how the fuck are you gonna act man you know so you really believe in like a form of karma um, maybe not so much karma because I don't believe, I believe cause and effect. Uh, I don't, okay. I don't think, I don't think karma plays karma. People tend to misuse that word karma. Yeah. It's, yeah. um, well, what you put out yeah, comes cause back and, to you. In yeah, a cause and effect. Degree, that, right? That's a better, yeah. yeah. You know, um, so if I'm being faced with, with the darkest shit imaginable it at the, at the end of the day, it's within me to decide how I react to that shit, you know, and that's how I stay positive. Right. Because it would happen, you know, we'd be on patrol, you know, I'd usually be like one or two guys behind the point, man. And, um, you know, Hey, there's, well, there's a, a fucking bomb up there, man. It's like, well, all right, man. Like this, yeah, yeah. yeah. what I'll do is I joke around. I'll fucking be like, all right, man, here, hold my cigarette and don't let it go out. I'm gonna go fucking have <laughs> it. Yeah. You know? I, I, these are a good, like, uh, cause we, like, right there, we've right? all, we've all had first, first hand intimate experience with IEDs. That's when I think back and I think about my time in Afghanistan a lot, like, you know, three, three deployments there. And then, and then a couple other trips as a contractor, I spent a lot of time there, you know, and it's like a big part of my, most of like, I was in Iraq, I was in Somalia, but when I think about my time in the Marine Corps, I think about Afghanistan primarily. And I think about the IED stuff a lot. And I get a, you talking about how you like make a positive use out of this stuff. I don't know if you guys did it this way, but like, it was, it was, Cody here and, and his contemporaries that like trained us in this method, but we did a lot of moving around on foot in the helmet. Okay. So I got yeah, three, three same. deployments in the helmet, right? So moving around on foot out there and you have to, 
the game, you know, you don't care about who's shooting at you really, right? Like you're you're focused on the victim operated IED threat, primarily the pressure plate, right? And um we had a technique called the um called the finger sweep, right? So I'm oh, yeah. I'm I'm making movement on foot and we had our commandos and stuff, but basically us as the you know, the the raiders that are in charge of those guys, we're driving, we're we call it quarterbacking, right? As the element leader, I'm making all the decisions and I'm actually making most of the like I'm it, it, okay. So if, if we're going to, you know, we got to cross an area that I got, you know, my, it's got the hair on the back of my neck up a little bit and I'm a little freaked out and maybe I see some disturbed earth or I see some of the other visual indicators that an IED might be present. And I've done, you know, I've got the commando over there with the Valen. He doesn't hit anything. Maybe I have the dog sniff around, but I'm still not hundred percent. Sometimes what I have to do is drop down on my knees, take my fucking gloves off and then use the tips of my fucking fingers to push forward in the dirt to find the edge of that fucking pressure plate. Yeah, dude, that's you know, how we operate. That is an absolutely absurd thing to be doing. And so you should think about it. Like some in the past, like right now, really I'm like this normal guy when you, when you in the like burbs that, putting yeah. around. But at various points in my life, I've been on my hands and knees trying to find the edges of a victim operated ID with my fingertips. That's wild, right? So I like when if I'm having a bad day or something or if something, there's some sort of administrative fucking hassle I'm dealing with or my kids are being insane. Like I can access that and I can be like, motherfucker, you're not on your hands and knees right now in the middle of the night trying to find a, a fucking bomb with your fingertips after having seen people blown clear the fucking half with those devices. So it's like not an abstract thing. It's a very serious thing. And I like I'm able to tap into that whenever I want and be like, ah, dude, I got there's no problems here. I have no problems. <laughs> right. No problems. Like, yeah, it's all good. You, you guys are throwing so many gems out there. I want to try to like hone in on one thing. And Dude, then... so they, well, back to the finger sweeping thing, man. But um, they, they were pissed because all our engineers cut the tips off our gloves yeah. so that you could finger sweep mm -hmm. it. If, if you don't have the, the tips on, you have no dexterity to feel. Wait, why, wait, wait, wait. Why were they pissed? Because it didn't, because it was, because that, was that, that, that what meant was that we were going to, that you were that issued we, the gloves. Yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> it, it said if you got to the uh, point where you were going to finger sweep, you should redirect. Ah, uh, you see, bro, that that's sounds one, great in a book. That's the difference from someone right. in the office to someone in the field, right? Well, that sounds great and, in a book, not in a fucking corridor. And, you know I mean? and honestly, not like in between buildings, I never was on the like recruiting thing for Marsoc. They like take Marsoc dudes and have them go. But but that's what would my main thing would be would be to go around the Marine Corps and be like, look, dude. There's a place where they basically don't fuck with you. Like they'll fuck with you in the rear and garrison or whatever, but nobody would ever no, nobody they could try. They could be like, don't cut the fingertips off your gloves. I we'd be like, yeah, all right, dude. Go for it. Not only am I doing that, but I'm gonna fucking put all the gloves in a pile and burn them. Like just because you <laughs> Yeah. And, and what they're not taking into, into account, was it was that coming from the engineer HQ or is that the that was, that like, was the engineer HQ, yeah. yeah not yeah, because the grunts are like, "What are you talking about? We are the objectives right over there." Like, what the, they ain't trying to hear that, shit, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, it wasn't. Uh, you know, there, there you, was two you, of us. Were you in the to a front uh, squad? So engineers. you were in a like dismounted all the time. One hundred percent. Who are those dudes that? Uh, I was never in a unit that had these, but like I saw that I talked to Marines up and saying, and they'd have them all sitting there blown up. They were like a weird looking vehicle that's supposed to park over the it's top me meerkat. That's what that is. Yeah. And yeah. It, and it's built so that when it hits an ID, the like cab part blows up. They had yeah, like, like I've never one, seen one, one motherfucker was in that thing. Dude, it's saying, saying yeah. And, and like one Lance Corporal would get like blown up six times on one deployment or what? <laughs> like, no. like maybe more. I don't know. It, it, <laughs> maybe more. <laughs> it's crazy. It, dude, it's crazy the kind of shit that regular, like, cause like by the time I got to Marsoc, it had been a long fucking time since I was like a dude in an infantry battalion where they can just do whatever to you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I would like forget sometimes what the regular Marine Corps is like. And then I'd bump into, dude, uh, we were, uh, you guys know where Fob Robinson, that Sangin area. I don't know if you yep, were in hell. Yep, 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 yep. We, uh, we were, we were at Fob Robinson. We were moving, going somewhere to do something, but we're in a vehicle convoy and our captain, his homie that he went to like fucking officer cannon school. I don't know. Some college boy buddy of his was with the Mew. The Mew was like parked in this big holding area. 
And then they had the Mew strung out in fighting positions looking at the 611. It was when they were paving the 611. This is like 2010, 11, something like that. Yep. So they've got all these dudes off the ship sitting in fighting positions oriented towards the 611 guarding this like construction project. And it's the middle of fucking like winter, right? So yeah. we're, it's a shitty rainy day and we're driving over to fucking see these other Marines and we're driving past these positions and it's just a bunch of grunts sitting in like, uh, up to their thigh and water in these fighting positions. And they got like one Matt V that's like the company gunny's little truck or whatever. And they're just like sitting in these ho fucking holes suffering and dudes in my truck that had never been in the grunts are like recon babies, or they came straight to Marsock from some other pogue shit, you know? So they're like, Holy f They're like flabbergasted, right? They're like, why the fuck are those guys just sitting in fucking holes full of water? And I'm like, Motherfucker, do you not know like what the fuck the infantry is, dude? <laughs> like, how do so you not? You, were you both over in like 2010, 2011 in country? Yeah, yeah, yeah. did basically all 2010. Yeah. yeah. Were did were you aware of like the PMT and the ETT teams that were? Like, oh, for sure. Yeah, yeah, yep. yeah, so yeah, yeah. I was attached to two three, and I got put with a, a PMT team that was in the middle of a uh, route one and route six oh six. We had a like a big patrol. It was like an old NDS compound that we took oh, over. Oh, cool. Okay. It's an NDS compound. It's like, it's like uh, their CIA. Yeah, it's like, yeah, it's like a CIA. weird CIA section of yes, yeah, Afghan know, CIA, Afghan security to a certain degree. I don't, I don't even really, yeah, I don't even really know. It's like Afghan spooks. Yeah, which yeah. is crazy to think about. But yeah. anyway, um, <laughs> anyway, so we were at we we're at this compound with them, and we were tasked with setting up patrol bases all down Route One and all down Route Six Hundred Six, and we'd have to get like tagged along by like two to three afghan like the toyota high backs yeah high lux. yeah high lux. yeah 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 and sweet trucks yeah, honestly yeah. they take a beat would, the it'd be the shit to get one <laughs> but just just seeing that at that level being we got immersed with the like the the afghan locals in our area and, and just to get the information that we got out of them hearing the stories they had about the russians before us and just seeing how they like dialogue the information and gave it back to us. It, it, it was, it was really thinking about it now, like how you're describing things that you went through. It takes so long to like really realize what was going on while you were over there. Dude, don't, Afghans don't appreciate it at the time. It's a wild place, man. It's, you know, the graveyard of empires. And, and I really like not all, I have a uh, overall positive uh, kind of view on the Afghan people. Like I, you know, I obviously they're not from our culture. Like I used to tell dudes, you know, when you're in a soft team, you you know, a lot of what you're doing, it's like unconventional warfare stuff. So it's about building rapport, maintaining rapport. We go yeah. like, I, you know, I speak Dari. Most of the guys would go to at least some Actually. language training or whatever. So, yeah. So you're out there and, and the game is like, hey, look, we're partnered with these guys. We we treat them like they're a fellow teammate, you know, to the degree that we can. And like a lot of the younger guys, they didn't get it. So like they'd be super frustrated, right? And they'd be like motherfucking the Afghans because they can't do X, Y, Z. Or how come this guy, we can't train him to use the GPS. He's a retard. I'm like, hold on a second, man. That's an ignorant mindset. Don't you think that if that dude grew up in your house, like I would ask it like a question. Like, do you think that if that dude grew up in your house with your parents, went to your high school, right? Played sports with you, hung out with your friends. Would he be like you? Or would he still be a retard? And then conversely, if you grew up in a fucking place that looked like the Bible times, right? And the first time you ever saw anything that took batteries <laughs> is when you showed up at like a and boot camp. Would you be like him? You know, like, come on. Like, do you, are you, is it, is, are you like a product of your environment or do you really believe that like Afghans are retarded? So some of Sadly, them are a lot of retarded. Them do, dude. Just trying to like break down that complex on a patrol with like, what you're describing is like the typical grunt that just goes over their kill, towel head, very yeah. narrow minded, very they don't give any reverence to them actually being a human being like us. You know what I'm saying? So you get so much more out of them when you treat them like an equal and actually like take the time to learn maybe some word, uh, words in their language to converse yeah. in their language with them. They, that, that's respect to them. So no. they're going to give you so much more. Yeah, it is a delicate mix, though, because like you, <laughs> they are great. Like we always say, like we had a lot of leeway with these guys and stuff. So like, but here, like there's certain rules with the Afghans that are kind of true all the time. Like, all right, if you go out with your, with your commandos or whatever on a, you know, several day patrol and uh, you buy him a goat from like some farmer, 
Oh, they want, they always, they're like, hit you up. They're like, they're like, Hey, you know, can we get a goat? We're, we want to eat yep. a goat. And like, and if you break that day and you give them a goat, get a goat first, so true. dude, then every other commando in the Kandak is going to sweat every other soft team. They're going to, the word's going to get around that the gringo, the Americans are buying goats and they're not going to shut the fuck up about <laughs> it until everybody, you know what I mean? Like they're very, they're kind of childlike. It's uh, the grown up. Give me a pen. Give me a fucking candy. You've been dude. to a few Shuras. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. 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 So yeah. you know that you all, they, the only thing they care about is what you're bringing to the table. So yeah, what, what you're giving them. And that's the only, it's always something for something. So well, dude, gonna... these guys, when you meet some of these village elders and like, I was, you know, spoken to these guys, you're, you're like, let's take the Hellman or, or actually a more like the Hellman had a lot less engagement over the years. till like, till we were running around there. But like, if you take some of the places out West or whatever, like you, you sit down with the, to share with these guys and you start making promises. We're going to dig you a well. We're going to make sure you get electricity. We're going to fucking do it. And this is the same spiel. This old dude's heard from whoever, like everybody that's come through there said the same shit. You know? Yeah. You're the ninth group of Americans to come through here and promise. It's like, yeah. we're there for six to eight months promising all these people, the world. And they're like, nah, dude, you're going to well, come out here. Fun. You're going to try to get us to tell you where the Taliban are at. Um, you're gonna get in some firefights in my neighborhood. You're gonna fuck everything up, and then you're gonna and you're gonna go home. You know, so yeah. Then so, you're gonna call your boys, and they're gonna come back yeah. again. Six Dude, months, and they're gonna do it again. I I I pay a little bit of attention to like I have a kind of into the Taliban. So I like watching what these dudes are up to. Like, there's some Twitter Indian accounts Taliban and shit where awesome. you can. So okay. like the Taliban are crazy, right? So they got all of our shit that we left, and then they got a bunch of money. So like when you see these guys now, these dudes are like. Mitch helmets, fucking ear, like That's they look amazing. like fucking. They look like a real ass military, like driving around in 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 RGs and MRAPs and shit. So I'm kind of like, I'm like, ah, look at the Taliban's all grown up or whatever, right? <laughs> what, I'm, <laughs> what I'm hoping for is that place to stabilize to the point where I can go the fuck back there and just kick it, like ride dirt bikes or like go. I, I want to take my time. son back there someday and just. I would love to go back there. They'd have to do some demining before I feel good about fucking. <laughs> <laughs> but like i i'm hopeful that at some point if we can just leave those guys alone i don't mind that they are on some sharia law shit like cool i'll i will fucking uh, if i bring a woman i'll cover her head no problem you know like, <laughs> yeah dude i'll leave the woman at home and bring the two yeah, I will bring so her, many yeah. people off nobody nobody thinks like this nobody like there's such an ignorant mindset when it comes to this stuff i feel like i've been so alone and like the things you're saying right now are, is like everything i've thought for so long but whenever you speak on it you're not alone man yeah yeah it, it's it's just it's not looked at in a in a way that's you know even the guys that I keep in touch with that I was engineers with or that, that I was an engineer with you know other sweeper buddies that I talk to those dudes and none of us can come up with like a solid why were we really there yeah <laughs> like you know I've Don't, been I, I lost I lost thirteen in country and I've lost ten to suicide since we yeah see home. that's that's yep. You, you um, tell me to up a project for a new American century. Yeah, you guys know about that. PNAC. So that's I the reason. If you wonder what we're doing in the Middle East, like project for a new American century, this is these, you know, kind of Zionist, um, neocon psychopaths, basically, that um, was it, who was it, McChrystal? That, uh, not McChrystal, who's the guy that starts with uh, the other general? The guy that found out about this PNAC thing and spilled the beans. There's a oh, Clark. No, it starts with the S. The, uh, anyways, one of this big four-star army general, kind of, he's famous for. You can watch the clip. He's he's said this in an interview that um, he was in the Pentagon poking around, and this is after 9/11. So the towers come down. Let's let's save that for another because that's another <laughs> whole fucking thing. Yeah. So yeah. so the towers come down, and they're the 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 Defense Department, Pentagon's all in a spin about what what we're gonna do about this shit. And um, what he thought was going to happen was that we were going to go into Afghanistan. Well, we did go, but like, you know, all he was aware of is like, hey, we're going to Afghanistan because that's where we think bin Laden is. and We're going to get him. So he's aware of that goes back into the Pentagon for meetings, bumps into this guy. And he's like, hey, so what's the deal? We still going to do the Afghanistan thing. And he's like, yeah, but we're doing Iraq, too. And he's like, what are you talking about? Right. And so that's what <laughs> on him. And he's like, hey, look, PNAC project for new American century. It's like the results of this think tank. And they outlined uh, seven, seven, right? Seven. seven Middle Eastern yep, uh, countries that. we were going to do regime change on, basically. And so and we're down at this point. We're down to just like Iran. <laughs> is the well, ones like, Afghanistan. Yeah, Syria didn't was on yeah, there. Iran. They didn't get what they wanted, but they, they've known for 20 years now. This is this is a long term project by these neocons. And there's a bunch of reasons. There's a bunch of geopolitical, uh, commercial related, weird, you know, 
resource related shit. Who knows? But like, if people are wondering like what you're doing there, it doesn't like the details almost don't matter. What matters is, is like what you were serving was this really deranged kind of, in my opinion, evil, like, cause I believe in a objective good and like a moral thing, you know? And yeah. I think that the project was, still do. remains evil, but people like it, it bums people out because they, like I it's said, definitely like, a bummer, dude. It's, definitely it's not, a bummer. It, it, I mean, it can be, but like, it's also not because even if I'd have known, like if I'd have known it was all nonsense back then, if I'm being honest, yeah, I would have, I'll give you, here's, so the invasion of Iraq, right? 2003. We're I'm in I'm in uh second battalion first marines in the scout sniper platoon. I'm fully believing all the 9/11 shit back then. I'm like country's under attack, like must go kill all these people. So yeah, now we're, we're Yeah, we're in Kuwait, yeah, like in back. holding area, right? What we're, we're waiting to invade Iraq. And um, this is before like anybody has like phones and internet and all sorts of shit. So we're, I remember sitting on the back, like our platoon sergeant had this like transistor radio and we're crowded around the back of this Humvee listening to the head of the UN, this guy Hans Blix. And they're going to make the determination like the UN security council was going to vote. Will the coalition invade Iraq and get, and get this shit going? I'm like, I'm, I wasn't, I, I was like an atheist back then, but I was doing like my version of praying, like almost like crying. I'm like, if this motherfucker says no, I'm going to fucking my head's going to explode. Like I'm I'm like desperately wanting to go invade Iraq. It was like and then, you know, literally like when he's like they've made the decision to invade, we're like cheering, running around like, you know, like sick. We're going to get it on. Like so again, like I'm coming back to my thing, like I got what I wanted out of the experience. So yeah, veterans right. that are hurting, they need to find a way to like make it not matter what these fucking deranged like psychopaths are up to, you know, like well, and since you know, since Afghanistan fell the way it did, you know, it, it would almost seem to me like a path for I don't know if redemption is the right term, but you know, the path forward for those guys would be to find out exactly why it went down like that. So I agree. Yeah, because that because that would that would tell you. Well, you know, we know that the path leads back to your own back door, back of course. To you, but at least at least here to, to home. But then that gives you a new mission. Like, yeah, why can't we get these motherfuckers out of power? You know what but I'm saying? I feel like, like that's where it stops every time. Well, it gets to the point where we're like, oh, this is why it's but, but we can't. What are we going to well, do? We have trip on, lives. So yeah, we, have, yeah. we all work nine to five jobs. You know, how are we yeah. going to? get to the yeah, point where we can revolt you know what i mean well so you don't though so you point at these psychopaths right and like the whole like this whole government like left right politics like saying two wings of one shitty bird like it's pro wrestling it, it, like don't ever like accuse me of voting or anything like i'm i don't I even was, believe was, i don't believe in democracy democracy is tyranny like i'm not into it but like the truth is in my opinion what it seems to me is that like we all live in this this matrix of our combined moral choices now this isn't me like moralizing to people like you need to open your bible and stop fucking whacking off to pornography what that's not what this is about it's about taking a step back and understanding that we have the leaders that we deserve we have these people because we tolerate it little by little incrementally over time they've worn us down they've undermined the nuclear family they've undermined our moral structure Again, not about like my uh, anyone specific like religious code or anything, but it's like, hey, it's quite obvious now at this point that we've we tolerate all this shit. We tolerate yeah, like yeah. the sexualization of our children. We tolerate um, we tolerate too much. And so right. at the risk of sounding intolerant, well, I just I'm not tolerating the shit in my life anymore. And then guess what? Once you kind of put your foot down and you say, hey, look, no, no more, you know. Now, it doesn't solve the problem because you can't convince people like they have to get there on their own. But like it at least make at least helps you understand like this isn't just out of nowhere. I'll give you guys a sort of like a, a potential course of action because it's the one that I settled on. Right. So being Marines, you guys understand this. When you run into an ambush, you got two options. Right. So you're walking down the trail and you, and you get ambushed. Step one is uh, if it's not a numerically superior enemy you face into the fire and immediately assault that shit right with as much violence yeah, as you right. could possibly possibly yeah, yeah. muster right 
Now, if you walk into an ambush with a far numerically superior opponent, the the other option you do is you break contact. Push. Now, so when I did all this research, you know, when I when I looked into it, what I figured out was I was on the X, dude. I was I was the target of a, you know a depopulation agenda, like all this shit. And um, so since the enemy is numerically superior, you know, you've got a corrupt military industrial complex, you got a corrupt entertainment industrial complex, a corrupt medical industrial complex. I can't do anything to break those complexes by myself right now. That's a numerically superior foe, man. So what I decided to do was to break contact, man. And, and, and sort of the way that I kind of uh, rationalized that or looked at it was they own the system. So step number one is I can't bitch about a system that they own if I, if I continually participate in it. So for my own, and this is just me, man, and I'm just throwing it out there as a, as a, as a possible way to move forward, man. So I started to, to break contact. We, you know, we call it get out of the system, G-O-O-T-S or Gooch, you know. You, you just, like Aaron said, man, like, okay, I don't watch the fucking porn anymore. I don't, I don't engage with this, you know, like, and then slowly by, by in, incremental gains, man, you know, we got ourselves into this deep shit over a long period of years, you know, <clears throat> and you know, it's like getting out of shape or anything. It's going to take you, you know, painful, painful work to get back into it. So, you know, for us, um, you know, one of the thing, one of the, the operations that the enemy uses against us as people is, is, is they break us apart, man. So like our families are spread all over the fucking place, you know, it, your support network isn't really there. And, and, and I, I learned a lot of this, like, like looking at the VSP life, like we'll, we'll take you two fellas, for example, right. You guys trust each other with your lives, right? Yep. Yeah. Like you're never going to fuck each other up. Do you, you guys aren't married <laughs> to each other. No, I mean, like you, you don't have, no, you don't he's have, married. I'm single. Yeah. I'm married. All right, man. I mean, you would trust that dude with your old lady, right? Yeah, of course. yeah, yeah. Yeah, so like so I when I was sitting in that office in Marsock just looking at this man, I was like, okay, man. Back at a certain time period, there were people that got in their fucking wagons and left, dude. And they they went off somewhere else and they started something new. You know, I'm sure you guys got a little bit of wake up money through the VA or whatnot, you know. And it, and it's not about chasing the monetary lie that they tell you about like, oh, we're all going to be millionaires in this shit cuz that that's a fucking lie. What it what it's possibly about is instead of racing to the top, you race to the fucking bottom, man. If there's, we tell people, hey, man, put some space between you and the beast because this year is gonna be fucking funky, man. Mm -hmm. So you know, if you can get a very small plot of land together, man, like maybe like an acre, doesn't have to be crazy, maybe five acres, you know, you can find you can find shit for like not a terrible amount of money, man, and then you just reduce your dependency on the system by shrinking down your fucking lives man if you if you can get to the point where hey maybe you're still commuting back to your gig man not a big deal you know aaron's still fucking commuting from the burbs and shit like i consider myself like the advanced party out here you know we're on a 52 acre farm on, the, on a fucking mountain basically like it. and um you know you bring your you bring, hey do family are the you know friends are the family you chose for yourself like that's your fucking brother right there man you guys have formed that bond now so it it wouldn't have been nothing for you know back in the 1800s for a couple of brothers to Hits their fucking wagons up and post out, man. And you know, you just you look at just reducing dependency. Like, do you do you need a me either? I love it. Yeah. yeah. Do you do you need a McMansion in the suburbs, or, or can or can you build like a cool little you know six hundred square foot place and your buddies maybe an acre away with a, with a little six hundred square foot place or something? Like when when we did this, dudes would sweat us like, "Were well, you guys gonna fucking live together?" It's like no man, we are we're on fifty two acres, bro. And, <laughs> yeah, and then I would, and then I, I would ask, you, seriously? yeah, I would ask those people like, well, where do you live? Well, I live in this neighborhood. I'm just like, well, how close is your nearest neighbor? Oh, you know, seventy five yards. I'm like, do you know that motherfucker? Yeah, you're yeah, living exactly. anyway. Yeah, yeah, like, you know, um, plus it, it's good. Like, I know it sounds like we're like down on America and stuff, but I'm not actually because if I was, I would leave. You know, so this still is a place like, if for the most part, you're. The people are still good, great people. Like I, all this like shit you see going on on you know. Just a moment, boys. I gotta take a quick. Yeah, I do. But so like you, you know, you see all this like traumatic, you know, shit about the country crumbling. Like when you look on your phone or whatever. But in actual reality, like in my daily life, like people are still fine. And this you know that because you've traveled. Yeah, sure, exactly. And so this is still a place where you can do, like he said, you 
can go buy yourself a little bit of land. You can arm yourself. There's no prohibition, even in like fucking places where they have strict gun laws. Once you get out of the city, you still can do whatever you want. You know, like yeah. this still is a place where you can do all this shit. Like, honestly, this was my ultimate question to both of you. Yeah, yeah. No matter what, you know, idea we bring up or, or conspiracy theory we talk about, it all comes down to the same thing. It all comes down to, you know, this is what's going on. You, you both said it. We both know there's something wrong. Whoever's behind the wheel clearly isn't bringing it in the right direction. So what, I mean, the, the thing I've been on is, is trying to get a stronger leader, maybe get vets in politics because the guys are doing, but you're right. The system's owned. This is, there's no way to win at any point because whenever there's been a strong leader, they've always been corrupted at some point by whoever's running, whatever, whatever is at the very top clearly influences everything to a certain degree. Well, I think you, that's a good idea to get. So in my opinion, like you get involved locally, right? So the national level politics, you can't, the, no matter what anybody says, you, the people of this country do not have access to the levers of power at that level. The, there's no, the voting is not real. I'm sorry, people get upset. No, right. <laughs> at the national level, don't even worry about that. Don't let it lower your your frequency into this like fear state. Just ignore that. But locally, look, they can pass whatever laws they pass at the national level. But it, when it comes down to where you live, there are local people that have to enforce those laws or 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 not, right? And so there is some... Uh, terrain to be conquered in your local area you can and then like you can um, there's no prohibition on having private uh, membership organizations in your in your town in your area there's a bunch of things you can do to kind of inure yourself to the uh, overreach of government at the local level I think that's and that's part of this like national distraction look that's why for a year like they're starting it in January they're like oh the election year and they're just going to continue to bombard us with this bullshit for a year. Well, in that year, what you could be doing instead of focusing on national level politics and, you know, Trump and Biden and all these other weirdos, just at your local level, you know, that's what's important. That's where your like local property taxes are, are um, decided upon. The sheriff is a big deal in your area. Like you could get relations that actually affect us. Yeah. That affect you. Yeah. That you can actually influence. Like, I don't think the, the political system at the local level, unless you live in a big city, is like corrupt all the way. It could be, but I mean, it's not necessarily corrupt like it is at national level. You still you still have an ability to get in and influence things and, and play some sort of I mean, ultimately, it is a long game because it's not going to happen overnight. But I mean, you can do something to change it ultimately if you have people back. Yeah, like you see um, with this school board stuff like, I, you know. I Anytime I see people getting active, I'm suspicious, but like, I like that people showed up, they figured out there was porn in their kids' schools and they showed up and started raising hell. That's good. Like if they're going to start doing things that you don't like, then, then create friction, make it, make, put a tax on them. You know, like if I mean, you're going to, that's, that's, stuff, that's then, the basis of the, of the country. Like when you, when you yeah. speak of America, like you can, you can stand for, you're allowed to stand for what you believe in. Right. I, I think the idea of, of putting your faith in a leader is 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 a psyop, right? Because yeah. a, a leader, a single a single person can be a target, a single person can be uh marginalized, a single person can be you, you know, if they're put up there like at that pedestal, right? Right. Unfortunately, what it's gonna take is uh it's gonna take individual effort, you know, and, and a lot of people Americans have been sold some fucking bills of goods, man. Like uh it's almost like they're always looking for somebody else to become the savior, right? It's it's like, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. well, the military is going to save us or the cops are going to save us. And when, you know, the Freemasons have set this joint up, you know, uh, the point of this place was for each individual to be a sovereign, each individual to, to, to be their own monarch, man. The, the right. term monarch comes from two words, mono and archon. Mono meaning one, archon meaning leader. Meaning you're only ever the leader of one person and that's yourself, right? So, so if all of us in the aggregate, I'm stealing that from Mark Passio. You guys love Mark Passio. I'll send you a link. Um, if all of us in the aggregate become monarchs, you know, we, we don't need a leader because, you know, the leader cannot, you know, we can, they can assassinate MLK for, you know, for, as an example, you know, they can kill Kennedy. But, if, but if every single one of us realizes that, no, I'm a sovereign being like I'm a monarch. Uh, and then we all act like that together. And we, then we're all moving forward together. You know what I'm saying? It doesn't matter if, if they, they fucking take me out. Aaron's still moving forward. You know what I'm saying? It's, right. it's, 
it becomes a it becomes a wave man and we just need to get i say we like the four of us are going to do it but like but fuck it maybe we are um i say this all the time we're going to change ourselves and then our kids are going to change the fucking world man like um we just take on the responsibility that I'm not going to wait for the cops. I'm not going to wait for a leader. I'm not going to wait, right. for, you know, like I'm going to stand in my own honor and I'm going to stand with other people that do it as well. And collectively we'll just, we'll just grow that. And yeah. And so uh, when you, when you self-organize, like, let's say, you know, 10 families in your area that are like-minded, right. They see, you know, very uh, primary important things, the same with the, how to educate kids. Maybe, you know, you're, Maybe it's COVID related, you know, opinions or whatever, but like minded people, people that are like you, 10, 10 families within 10 miles of you, or, of you or whatever. That's the kind of activism people need to be engaged in, because then when the government tries to overreach and they try to, you know, do whatever they're going to do, you've got a group of people that are going to be a problem. They're going to they're gonna say, hey, no, we're not doing it. Just like you can look at the um, Orthodox Hasidic Jewish community in New York City when the COVID heavy handed COVID stuff came. They were like, nah. Yep. And the government was like, all right, fine, not you guys, right? Like because of their problems, right? Right, I guess. what you don't do, and this is what a lot of people don't understand, like it's an, it's an energy thing. It's a polarity thing, right? So like the the, the beast system, that, that like we call it, they're adept at using this this kind of technique. And what when you um, raise hell in the streets, like, you know, okay, hey, we're going to do a trucker rally thing like Canada. Or we're going to do a free Palestine thing or whatever. That's all like an energy harvesting event. Okay. So you're actually just empowering the system. There's both edges, both sides of the political spectrum, left and right, get, get generate economic activity off of that. And then they generate a bunch of fear programming and all sorts of shit. So when you participate in this large scale political okay. unrest, all you're doing is having your en energy harvested to feed into the thing that you're protesting against. It's you're there's that kind of activism There's not going to result in anything. And that's all to pull your energy away from you finding 10 families within your area, getting together, being like, this is bullshit. We're not doing it. And then that's it's all like a big game, you know, and you got to you got to play it a little smarter. Well, the people that follow this podcast, honestly, are at the basic level. You understand these. these I just have veterans that are coming out and, yeah. and they're dealing with and they don't even. It takes a while to to read into things and follow different trends to understand even what we're talking about. So what would you what would you even recommend to, to guys at that level to, to try to transcend the, the first basic hoop that they're at, which is I'm an infantry guy and, 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 and I'm going to do go. anything to save America. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, wh where do you even take it from there? OK, good question. Well, so the first thing is, if there's even a question about some of the wild ass shit we're saying, right, the first the first thing is for, is for folks to understand this. Right. Like they're. Um, we get we get this weird idea like we know what's going on because because of the narrative right we're always fed a narrative but if you just stop and honestly tell yourself the reality is i know what i i i can verify for fact what i've what i've experienced through empirical experience right like i like i'm sitting here right now i know exactly where the fuck aaron is right like once Aaron leaves here, I have no idea what the fuck he's doing. Like I got an idea what he's doing. Right. But it's like, it's outside of my realm of, of empirical, like, like reality. Right. So if you realize that the, the majority of the fucking planet is that like, I like uh, it, it's a massive mystery outside of, 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 of your first person experience, you know, it should, it should humble them enough to at least be like, well, shit, man, I really, I have just been told my entire life from this TV screen what what life is about. Like I don't, I don't actually know, man. So that yeah. that maybe will help to, help to get them to 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 accept some of this shit, and especially since we've seen so many things turn out not the way we were told, right? Um. So yeah. you know, if you're listening to our voices right now, and, and you're you don't consider yourself a conspiracy theorist, and you're like, yeah, fuck it, those guys are crazy, man. I would just invite you to just you know, take a look at some of this well, and forget, as, as yeah. a start, you know, and forget the conspiracy stuff for a minute, right? Like here's a couple of practical things that I would recommend to everybody to do. Uh, and, and you know, the, the, the fact is, is that if we're just products of, you know, American public schools, right. Then we're not educated people. Even if you, we have a, I have a degree in nonsense, a bachelor's degree in nonsense from the, from the internet. Right. So like, whatever, I'm not an educated, Phoenix. I'm not a classically educated person, which means that I've not been instructed in things like, Law, basic the basic formal rules of logic the logical fallacies rhetoric 
this is something that anybody with a that can read can access this stuff. You can go on the internet, and I and I challenge everybody to learn the basic uh, rules of formal logic and learn like the fifteen major you know logical fallacies. Right. Once you learn these things, when you start engaging in the stuff that the media produces, you will be able to spot these fallacies, these, these obvious breaks in logic that, that's the clue that tells you that what they're telling you is not true. Similarly, rhetoric. Rhetoric is the artful use of language. It's the use of language in order to control consciousness, okay? So what we're telling you, we're not, we've used maybe a little bit of rhetoric here when we're talking about the government in a joking way or something, but we're telling you, we're just speaking directly and plainly to you. That's not the way that the system communicates with you. The system uses rhetoric, right? So yeah. when when they're making claims that they can't back up, that it's obvious that they're not offering any you know substance for, they're using rhetoric. So people should learn rot logic, learn learn about rhetoric, and then pay attention for it. The other thing I would say, and the, and most people are not going to um, want to do this, or they're going to try to do it, and they're not going to get any traction at first, and they're going to give it up. But I, one thing that changed my life drastically, and I've done all kinds of weird plant medicines, ayahuasca. I've been on this journey to, to do all this stuff. And honestly, the thing that has helped me the most is developing a mindfulness practice. There's a bunch of different ways you can go about it. You can get a book, you can get an app, you can just go on YouTube. There's a billion videos on how to establish for yourself a mindfulness practice. And it's a practice. It's something, it's like lifting weights. It's something you have to do or shooting. It's something you have to. I don't even know what that is. Man. Explain that. Meditation. Me uh, mindfulness. Meditation is not a great word for what it is, but it's meditation, right? So literally like sitting somewhere, everyone has a kind of a, a different way. My me telling you exactly what I do wouldn't really help you because you got to kind of find your own way. But I can tell you that it took me a long time, you know, years to get to the point where um, when I'm disciplined about it and I do my meditation practice, it provides this in the in the moment that i'm doing it certainly but even in my waking life it effectively gives and this is i'm just giving you like a graphical way to um understand sure, sure. it like i'm just using imagery it's not actually like a force field but it creates a barrier around me that information comes in and instead of coming directly into my you know neocortex or whatever where i react to it it hits this barrier around me and then i and i it kind of slows everything down where I am able to process it. I can look at it. I can be like, I don't need to be afraid of that. That's rhetoric. Someone's trying to manipulate me. I'm, it, it gives you like a, 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 a calmness and, and it bleeds over into other aspects of your life. It improve your relationships, all that kind of stuff. So uh, the majority of our lives, we operate like on autopilot, right? Like think about it. You, you're driving to work and you got the radio on and uh, I'm guilty of up here. Cause I'll be listening to some fucking doomed out podcast as I'm like hammering or something, but it's turning <laughs> off autopilot and 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 taking back physical control right and 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 meditation kind of forces you to do that i'm gonna force myself to that, sit here that's a really good way you of know, saying it yes yeah, i like it's, that it's turning off the autopilot like okay um i was just doing some some medicine thing this last weekend and i was watching one of the facilitators i'm like and the guy moved slow man you know and when he was walking around the space you know he was he, he was just very slow very purposeful very methodical it wasn't it wasn't uh it's not living your life on autopilot, you know? And so if you can become like an observer, you know, if you can step, step back from that autopilot life and, and look at like Aaron's saying, like, like his force field, that split second of observation between, um, input and reaction, you know, like anger, dude, I'm a, I'm a fucking anger addict and a conflict addict called being a Gemini, whatever. Like I'm always looking for the opposite. Um, so when the anger trigger comes in, you know, if I'm not on autopilot, I can see it, understand it for what it is. And then I choose from a mindful perspective to not engage with it, you know? And as far as like a starting point, man, I would just throw some names out like, uh, mentors, man, of, uh, on a, on like a truth journey, man, Jordan Maxwell is a, is a fantastic one. You know, look up a guy named Jordan Maxwell. Just listen to listen to he's he passed away about a year and a half, yeah. two years ago, or something like that. We tried getting him on the show, but um, he was at the end. And it was you know cognitive, it was like whatever tech it didn't work out. Um, but I you know I listened to that guy talk, and you know I'd be in my garage, and I, as soon as he'd say something crazy, I'd hit pause, 
I'd fucking break out the Google machine and, and look at what he's saying. None of this shit is a secret. That's the thing. The enemy operates in the clear. Now, some of their, they're like the fucking Taliban and the ICOM, dude. They write books telling you what the fuck they're going to do, man. And, um, you know, some of their shit clearly is, is in secret, right? Like it's, uh, like all, all of the causal stuff that they do, like, hey, blow, blow up a fucking pipeline. You know what I'm saying? Guy, they, guys got to be careful with the conspiracy shit, though, a little bit. Like, especially you know, like young, I'm picturing like young veterans, you know, that are maybe kind of hanging on by a thread. You know, you can see this a lot with the like Q movement and stuff. It's like, yeah, you know, like you start looking into conspiracy stuff and you are going to go down these rabbit holes. Right. And guess what? It doesn't matter to your life who killed Kennedy. Like it doesn't like but people will spend like a decade learning all about it. And, and I'm just using that one as an example. Cam trip, every little conspiracy rabbit hole is its own deep rabbit hole. And it'll, and again, we're just bleeding away energy that we're supposed to be applying to what you really need to do is just pick a very clear goal, decide what the price is for accomplishing that goal and then determine whether you're going to pay that price or not and then get after it. Right. So that's, but I mean, these rabbit holes, like, like, you do have to kind of know, like the reason we didn't, we didn't, we weren't fooled for a second on the COVID stuff because we already were, we already had a bunch of information prior to that. Right. So there is some utility in kind of knowing what these guys are up to, but, but you don't need to know every Nats ass detail. I don't recommend people go fully into the, I love conspiracy stuff, but I, but if I'm given advice, my advice would not be to spend a whole bunch of time freaking out about, you know, the, the world economic forum and shit. Like that is a good point, but I do enjoy it. But yeah. Unless you can handle it. Unless, unless you're also able to take it like entertainment too, where you're like, cause it is a form like these, some of this black pilled conspiracy stuff. It is kind of a form of entertainment. I think it really, it, you need to see it for what it really is though. You can't, as you just said, you can't invest a thousand percent of your energy into who killed Kennedy. You need to see it as a chessboard being moved to yeah. accomplish certain things. And I think the people that, you know, dive into something holy or something like that, you're, 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 you're wasting your time to a certain degree. But I, I mean, I can get it to a certain standpoint, but I, I hear exactly what you're saying. Well, yeah. and then next thing you know, you know, you're fucking, you're, you're fucking throwing Nancy Pelosi's stapler at the wall or some shit. And you're in prison for fucking four years. You know, and it's yeah. like, yeah, I, those guys shouldn't be in jail, but also they shouldn't be in Pelosi's office yeah, fucking you, around, you know, like use it as an as, as a as a catalyst, a positive motion in your life. Yeah. Like, oh, shit, that is true. Oh, OK, cool. I'm going the opposite direction of that. I'm I mean, you have to take the, knowing about COVID to be a certain positive dude. I wouldn't want to you know, you look I, I, I hear what you're saying on both on both sides yeah. completely. And uh, dude, and then when you when you it's tough because like we face this all the time because people think we're nuts or whatever, but it's like the whole general order, repeat all calls from post more distant to the guardhouse of my own. It's like, Hey, I know some shit. I have a duty to fucking tell people like, I, you sure you want to do that science experiment? Motherfucker? Have you looked into this shit? You know, it's like, funny. You pulled yeah, yeah, yeah. Or, that's, I, literally, that what, I didn't know what number, number it was. Four, yeah. I literally <laughs> use that as why I do what I do on the fucking internet, dude. Like I found word and what well, even says it on the intro to our show, subscribe for the word, you know, yeah. like I found word and I, I don't get squirrely with the yeah, word. Don't play squirrel with the word. Yeah, I'm not a word hoarder, man. Yeah. Like I used to hate the motherfuckers. Like, but he said that you know, knowing we're going on a 20 mile ruck tomorrow doesn't tell me, and I'm crushing like a squat session <laughs> at the gym. And I'm just laughing like, yeah, oh yeah, legs, buddy. Get it. <laughs> it's like, bitch, you could have told me, man. Yeah, yeah. That's it. I get to this point at the end of all these, I mean, things that we speculate on, and I am always like, I get kind of. That's why I asked you, how do you stay positive? How do you how do you stay with just a a singular goal to to know that that is is the right route to a certain degree because it's taken me a long time and to become self aware enough to even be able to have this conversation with you yeah you know what I mean like there's so many rabbit holes and trap doors and and different things that you need to be to just to even be aware enough to know that you know government getting involved in the military is is a bad thing because honestly you're you grow up to think they're the good guys. Yeah, you think you're working for well, the good guys. Well, I'll say this, man. I watched the entire the soft white underbelly thing that you sent me, man. And uh, you look like you've done a tremendous amount of work in progress, dude. You look happy. You look fucking healthy. Now that right? I'm thinking about that, that I feel like you guys would hate that interview. Because that was like well, an was early say, stage yeah, was, of my life yeah. that I've like transcended from that. Because yeah, that's I'm, growth, dude. That's yeah, amazing. Yeah, that's awesome. I don't, I don't have anyone military in my family. Like where we're at, Massachusetts yeah, isn't like pro-military. So I didn't really have like a, 
it, it, I mean, it, it helps to have an older mentor in this shit, man. Someone that's been through it that can actually like guide you to the pathway that is the right way, if you will. But it's yeah, I bounce shit off honest. this guy all the time, dude. I'll fly off on some squirrely ass. It's it's amazing because as the bomb guy, I'm supposed to be like the calm guy, but I'm like the opposite. I'm like, what the fuck is going on? And like Aaron will hit me with some shit. He's like, look, dude, you know, it's- dude. And I used to spat like I used to spaz like when I was in the Marines. Like, look, I was was obviously do like doing my job, but I would bitch. I was one of those dudes that just everything was fucked all the time. Everyone's an idiot. Every yeah. officer sucks. Everyone's dude constantly for like twenty years. Like just, I think I bitched the whole time. And like, when I look back at it, if I, I don't have any regrets, I, I had a great time, but I would have allowed myself to enjoy it more. So I try to do that now. You know, there's things in my life now that I'm super into like my, my kid and shit. And so like, I'm trying to just enjoy it as much as possible because looking back at this other whole huge chunk of my life, I was like, ah, dude, none of that bitching ever helped. <laughs> and nothing ever no, got, never got you once. it never fixed anything. Right. <laughs> yeah. No, it, it, uh, it, it, I, I, yeah, I, 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 even like nowadays, I, I, I work for the postal service I okay. do a for a living. So Ooh, I think the, the post the, office is like the last legit government. Right? <laughs> so you know how, uh, they said all government employees had to get the vaccine. Yeah. But they couldn't so do it with the post office, right? They could not. <laughs> yeah. Cause the motherfucking mail needs to go. Yeah. Well, seven. They said that's fine. You can enforce your your mandate, but you're going to lose seventy percent of your work. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> hell yeah. And they, they, the government's response was like, "We'll, we'll bring in the national guard. They'll deliver the mail." No, they won't. Yeah, no shit. Yeah, steal, and, steal, and our steal, our union they'll never steal all the them. Amazon boxes. Right. Our, our, the postal union was like, "Okay, go ahead." Dude, let me ask a obscure uh, boss. You guys are in Boston or near there? Yeah. Okay. So, like, when I was a kid or you know, a young adult, I was, like, big punk rock guy, right? So, I'm just going to ask this weird – are you are you guys into, like, bo- like Boston scene, hardcore stuff at all? I mean, I I, I know. We grew up like, you ever hear, like, Blood for Blood? No, blood I know blood? Boston hardcore. Blood for Blood? Not Ring a Bell? No, no. Ah, no. dude, like, my one of my favorite bands. Like, you, if you ever – if you ever – if you're into metal or anything, check out this band, Blood for Blood. It's pretty – you might Get some like. people going? Oh, dude. There's a lot well, you'll, of you'll immediately that, fucking man. you'll immediately fucking invade someone's house nearby or something. <laughs> Very <laughs> intense. There's a lot of those uh, crazy rock bands from Western Mass, like Pittsfield. Yeah, right I'm also old as shit though, so I'm talking about shit that was cool like 25 years. Yeah, ago. Aaron's one of the only dudes I know with three combat action ribbons, man. Fucking yeah. Wait, 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 wait. The original wait, wait. Somalia. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's yeah. I was a in, bold statement. I was in uh, Somalia when I was like my first deployment when I was a. Uh, little machine gunner boot we went we did the un withdrawal from, from somalia so and then you know and then iraq and afghanistan so so was that that's three stars on it it's two star. it's two the stars. ribbon and two stars gotcha, yeah. Gotcha, gotcha. It's a yeah yeah salty. I got a regular and as, a, as, a, as an e6 too dude how many rooms have you been in with just like that sitting heavy and it, oh, dude, it was fair, it was pretty pretty ridiculous and then towards the end like there was guys that were like master sergeants that were that I was their boss, <laughs> like because I like literally I got to E six and then spent like a decade <laughs> not getting promoted. <laughs> <laughs> so wait, you you got out as a as an E six. But talk, what was your billet? My uh, critical skills operator, like so. Marshall so guy. you were at, what I'm what I'm asking is like, were you attached to a line company or? Were oh you, no, so I was. Yeah, yeah, I stayed in a team in until G7, yeah. yeah the end like the last year and a half they put me in the. The headquarters, like we run a exercise called Raven, which is like a like going to CAX kind of for Marsoc guys. Okay. So they have a bunch of operators in there that like help put on the exercise. So, but yeah, I so mean, you, I yeah, you got out in sixteen though. I retired in sixteen. Yeah. What What is it like seeing how this may be a basic question, but how the or what do you think about it? How the Marine Corps progressed? How it's changed in maybe what it's represented or, or the way that it's been trying, is, is it just strictly the AO that we're invading that, that has influenced the things that we've been dropping and, and the I, way, that- you know, they just got rid of the scout sniper program, which seems ri- ridiculous. Marsoc still has its sniper program, but like the Marine Corps in general, I don't know. It's, I don't have a lot of, I never, I didn't have a lot of viz towards the end on like the regular Marine Corps. I think that, uh, 
you know, as, as, as soon as you're not engaged in constant combat operations, the edge starts to dull and there's not, that's not anybody's fault. So like, you know, as soon as Marsoc guys weren't rotating constantly through Iraq and Afghanistan, then the, the, the kind of the proficiency falls off a little bit. And I imagine the rest of the Marine Corps is that way too, but also the Marine Corps did make some changes. Like they've improved the infantry training pipeline from what I was able to see. And I talked to, I got a couple of buddies that are gunners that are still running around and they're like, yeah, the, the training that young infantry guys get is way better. The equipment. I don't know if you noticed, like if you see, you know, on Instagram and shit pictures of like regular line infantry dudes, those guys are kitted the fuck out. Like yeah, they, yeah, they, they're, they're, they have good gear now. They have the yeah. appropriate uh, like gear for the job. So they're, I don't know. I think the Marine Corps is resisting that has done probably a better job than the other services. That might be my bias, but like, dude, they're still subject to all this diversity and inclusion. Like they're still on some woke bullshit, but like, That's what I don't I'm know. Saying. I don't know. I don't really know what the current state of like the regular Marine Corps is. Gotcha. We but I'm right. positive. It, like, no, 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 no. We got out right before that. Yeah, but, yeah. What do, anyway. Yeah. When did but, you guys get out? So I got out in 12, 13. Okay. Yeah, yeah. You, yeah, they didn't want, yeah, there's still Afghanistan was still going on. I have time. Yep. For yep. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Well, either way, dude, I, it's been great. It's been great talking to both of you. Yeah, man. It's yeah, been man. fun, dude. Yeah. Like, um, yeah, maybe you guys want to come on our show or something sometime. Uh oh, you freeze up. <laughs> Till I get the fuck out of here. Yeah, it's an abrupt ending. Jesus. Yeah, whatever. They got a lot of give good it, shit. Give it a second. Oh, yeah, my put. Well, I'm going to...